Thanks. Thank you, Oz. Hey, how are you guys doing today? Great. Great. So, uh, how many of you are here because you want to learn a little bit more about Vancouver real estate? Put up your hand. Great. Okay. So, how many of you uh, feel depressed when you hear the news talks about like the Vancouver as a city's unaffordability? Put up your hand if you feel depressed. All right. Great. Okay. And how many of you feel that it's a little bit stressful uh, just learning about uh, real estate and getting into it? Anybody feel stressed a little bit, a little bit complicated? Okay, great. So here, I'm here to uh, try to ease your um, the stress and uh, real estate can be complicated if you make it complicated, but it can be simple if you perceive it in a simple way. So today I'm here to maybe ease some of the stress that you're going through. And, uh, but before I get started, I wanted to talk about a little bit logistics. So there's a cordless mic here. If you guys have any pressing questions, uh, just put up your hand. I'll bring the cordless mic to you and just speak into the mic. It's not amplified, but it's there to uh, go, it's go, it goes to the video camera. So if you have any pressing questions, uh, just put up your hand. I'll bring the cordless mic to you. Uh, if you have, if you, you all have a notepad and pencil, a pen, so you can write uh, questions down and I'll save it for uh, the Q&A session afterwards. Uh, I'm also, the, you also have an agenda and that's, uh, we're probably not going to cover everything on there. So I'm going to ask you guys some questions here and there to see how, um, how much you know and what's not interesting and what's interesting and then I'll kind of fly by certain topics and then I'll go a little bit more in depth on other topics. All right, does that sound good? You ready? Yeah. Smile, smile. Okay, <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Okay, so the first thing is, uh, you're, you're probably asking, um, who's this Gary Wong? So I'm just gonna introduce who I am, a little bit of my family and background. Uh, so I'm married, my wife is here, she's sitting right over there. Put up your hand. Yeah, that's my wife. We have two children, a uh, four-year-old and a two-month-old. Uh, pretty a little bit stressful, you know, baby crying and that kind of stuff. But it's great. It's such a blessing, uh, you know. So I, I'm married. I've uh, been married for five years, and um, I'm born and raised in Vancouver. I have uh, I started. I lived in um, Burnaby in the beginning. Then I moved over to the West Side. Went to a school called Churchill. Then uh, went into uh, UBC to study psychology and Mandarin. That was my double major. My Mandarin sucks, which shows you how good the program at UBC <laughs> is at that time. At that time, okay. Then I worked in the corporate world. I worked in a bunch of entry-level sales jobs, and then I couldn't climb. I was having, and then I worked in a corporate job uh, for a solar inverter manufacturer. Okay, so uh, I worked there for a couple years. I was like. Mm, uh, finding it difficult to climb the corporate ladder. Any of you felt like that? It's hard to climb the corporate ladder? Or is it easy? Easy to get promoted or anybody feel difficult? Is it just me? Okay, so uh, anyways, I felt it was difficult. Um, you know, like I, I had to compete against other people and they're sucking up to the boss and all this stuff. And I just, I, I, I was like having trouble. So I went back to business school, I got married, and I was like, oh, I can't play games all the time anymore. I better like grow up and be a man. So <laughs> yeah, so I was like, okay, got to go back to school. Went back to school, studied this online program, online business program at SFU, and then I was tutoring a child at that time, and the child's father said, hey, Gary, you know, uh, the, my, the child's father was a local builder. He said, Gary, you know, uh, why don't you do real estate? Uh, if you get your license, maybe I'll give you some listings to sell. I was like, oh, great. You know, I've always been interested in real estate. From uh, when I was a child, my favorite game was Monopoly. And then uh, when I moved over from Burnaby to the Vancouver West Side uh, at 12 years old, I was like going to open houses with my parents, reading the Real Estate Weekly, and, and just uh, really interested in it. But, you know, a typical uh, Asian parents, uh, you know, they're like, oh, Gary, no, it's too competitive. You should be a doctor. Be a lawyer, be an accountant, you know, like real estate, owning your own business. No, 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 too, too dangerous. Any of you connect with me like that? Okay, so uh, that was the situation. So um, this guy, uh, the father, was like, Gary, why don't you do that? And I was like, okay, great. So I was studying the online business program, doing my real estate licensing, finished the online program, and I transitioned into the uh, SFU MBA program. And then, um, 
I finished my real estate licensing and I was like, um, I, I, before the MBA program, like so this, the, the topic of tonight is about the introductory real estate, but it's really a journey of me from knowing nothing to knowing something to knowing nothing again. And then the, the cycle repeats itself. So let me, let me describe that and reiterate it and kind of uh, expand on that concept. So before entering business school, I was like, oh, business, it's easy. I worked in the corporate world. I know it's, uh, what it's all about. Going to business school, I was like, oh, I know nothing about any of this stuff. That's why the VP thinks like that. That's why the directors of the company do this. And then, so after business school, I was like, oh, I know business school, I know business. I read the real estate licensing book, and I'm like, I know real estate. Go into the real estate industry, I'm like, I learned that there's like, oh, I have no idea how to do real estate. <laughs> I, I was like, huh? And then after a while in the real estate industry, I was like, oh yeah, I know real estate. And then I bump into a real estate investor, like a veteran guy. And then I'm like, oh, real estate investing, oh, it's easy. You just do this and this and this. And he's like, no, this is what you do. Da -da -da -da. I'm like, huh? I was like, teach me, I'm your grasshopper. I'm kind of like that when I met that guy. So in my book, uh, the book on Vancouver real estate, it talks about how I went from knowing something to knowing nothing to knowing something and then back to knowing nothing. And in, in, in your life, if you really want to grow and you, you have to be at the point where you're, you say to yourself, like, I know nothing about whatever topic. And that's when you can uh, take on the sponge mentality and really absorb whatever information you're trying to learn. So, uh, so that's when I started in my real estate industry and then I, I uh, wanted to compete against other, other uh, realtors and, and I had this 15 page business plan and I went to interview brokerages, I interviewed seven uh, brokerages and then I brought to them my plan and I interviewed them because like the stereotype is, oh, real estate brokerages, they'll take anybody that walks, right? So, so I was really picky, you know, some, some brokerages didn't even respond to me, some brokerages just flat out said to me, there's no training whatsoever. And then, I, so I had to be really careful of who I uh, put my name to. So I ended up working, uh, putting my name to McDonald Realty, and uh, after I did research and I interviewed them, and it was great. So I started working with them, training programs, great, and then, um, the, the, the problem was, okay, how do I compete in this industry? How do I differentiate myself? How do I make myself different? So I was thinking about it and, um, you know, I'm a Christian. That's part of uh, who I am. I go to church and, uh, and I really wanted to incorporate uh, my beliefs into, this, uh, into my business. How many of you guys know Jeremy Lin? Anybody know Jeremy Lin? Okay, he's a famous basketball player, plays in the NBA. I think he, I think he's in the LA Lakers still, right? Did he get traded yet or no? Huh? Hornets. Hornets now, okay. So anyways, um, so when I knew about him, he was like on the Knicks, New York Knicks. But anyways, I subscribed to his YouTube channel. One of his YouTube videos says, uh, it shows him training really hard and then at the end of the video it says, uh, he quotes scripture. He says, whatever I do, I do it as if working for the Lord. That's his scripture. And then I, I took that, I adopted it and I made it my business principle. So, um, you know, when I entered the industry, I was like, how am I going to compete? I looked at some other uh, colleagues and other realtors, and they started talking. So they, they're like, you know, um, the, the, the office room talks and stuff like that, the water cooler talks, and they're like bad-mouthing their clients. They're like, oh, I worked with this client for X number of months, and then they ended up buying with their mother, and then buying with their sister, and oh man, wasted all my time. And, 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 then, and then I was like looking at that, I was like, hey, that's not good customer service. That's like, like, you shouldn't be doing that, right? And then, so I was like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. So one of my motto in my business is here to serve. I was like, okay, I'm gonna help all my family and friends. I'm gonna help that builder, uh, that builder family because I want to, not because I want their business or anything. I'm just gonna serve them, serve them. And if they choose me, great. If they don't choose me, that's okay. You know, I just wanna serve them and not expect anything in return. So then I did that for the first two years and, and slowly people started trusting me. And then I, I started getting business, so I won some award, company award in the first year, and then won a bigger award in the second year, and then, 
And then I met my mentor in my second year, and then my, my mindset and everything just skyrocketed. And I wrote a book and all that stuff. It just, uh, yeah, exponentially went like 10x. So why did I write the book? Uh, just briefly, it's, uh, I saw the lack of transparency in the industry. Um, when it, before I went into the real estate industry, I saw I, I, there's like no public information that really guides the public. You know, so I, I, you know, I blog about it and, and then my mentor said, why don't you write a book? And then I was like, okay. So I started uh, uh, compiling my blog posts and just writing down notes and, and then just putting it into a book format. And then hence, that's the uh, kind of a summary of some good points in, in that book. It's 21 chapters, seven chapters on buying, seven chapters on selling, and seven chapters on investing. So. Uh, you know, take a look at it, read it when you have time, um, and I hope it, uh, you find value in it. So, uh, just to start off, you, you, you have an agenda. I want to ask, uh, how many of you have bought a home before? Put up your hand. Okay, so we don't have many, uh, like not, not everyone here is a first time home buyer. How many of you have sold a home? Put up your hand. Okay, a few, a few, a few, okay, okay. So. Um, so the first topic, what to watch out for as a first time home buyer, common mistakes. Um, let me simplify it. Okay, so everybody knows how to, why you should get pre-qualified for, before you go and search for a home, right? Because, oh, you know, you might not be able to afford it or, uh, you know, you might be wasting your time. Let's say you can, you're looking at $400,000 apartments, but you can only qualify for $300,000. Obviously, that's why you get pre-qualified. Everybody knows about that. And then, um, so when you, the, the, the key is when you get pre-qualified, the lender isn't promising you that they're gonna lend you the money. They're kind of just giving you an estimate. And then when you write a contract, and, and, um, and then what I tell my clients is you get a written confirmation from the lender, a written one, okay? Not a verbal one, why? Because going into the industry, I was talking to my managing broker who, who trains me a lot, and he said, like, sometimes they just change their mind. <laughs> so, so lenders say, like, okay, yeah, I'm going to lend you the money, lend you the money. And then, like, completion date comes, and they're like, oh, sorry, I changed my mind. <laughs> I don't like that building. And you're like, what? You know, it, the, so that's why you, and it has happened, okay? It has happened. That's why you need to get a written confirmation from the lender that they will lend to you. Because if they don't lend to you, but you have that piece of paper, you can take them to court later. Uh, usually they give you a written confirmation subject to a bunch of stuff. Subject to them reading the strata minutes, reading the documents, etc. Uh, it's really important that you don't just say, oh, I got a confirmation. You read that it's subject to a bunch of stuff because my client told me he got written confirmation like two weeks before completion. He's like, oh, sorry, the mortgage broker told me they're not lending. I'm like, what? I'm like, didn't you get written confirmation? He's like, oh yeah, it says subject to this document, this document. I'm like, oh, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> so, okay, yeah, just make sure you get written confirmation. Um, okay, uh, written confirmation of the lenders. Okay, how many of you have bought a house recently in the bidding war? In the bidding, Vancouver's bidding war? Okay, there's one, a couple. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna tell you uh, some bidding war strategies that um, that may apply to you as a first-time home buyer and may also apply to a seasoned uh, buyer. So one of the first things you do is you have to determine market value. So you work with your realtor to find uh, what it's worth. Use comparables in the in the area, and then the second thing is you have to determine your willingness to pay. Okay, so. Um, your willingness to pay is basically what you're willing to pay for it. Okay, just because it's worth a million dollars doesn't mean you're gonna pay a million dollars. Okay, so, one of the, so I, I usually go through this kind of uh, talk with my clients who, who wanna buy a place that's probably gonna go through a bidding war. I go through the market value, I go through the willingness to pay, and when, I re when, when we come to the conclusion, like they wanna buy it, they wanna win the bidding war, what do I do? Gary, and I say, okay, now we're ready. You want to write a subject offer or a subject free offer? 
So uh, most of you have bought a place. So subject offer means you have subject to financing, subject to home inspection, subject to a bunch of stuff. Subject free, obviously no subjects, okay? Uh, obviously sellers prefer a subject free offer when you're competing in a bidding war. It's basically usually the subject free offers are uh, going to win the bidding war. I've only encountered a few situations where the subject offer won over a subject free offer and that was because the subject offer was significantly higher than the subject free offer in terms of price. Okay, so uh, how many of you, uh, so those who have been in a bidding war, there's a couple of you, right? Did you guys have to write a, did you guys show a copy of your bank draft? No, okay. So here's a strategy. If you, if you find yourself in a bidding war, um, obviously you ask the, the listing agent, what are the, the seller's interests? Uh, are they, they want to move quickly? Uh, they, they want to uh, lease back? lease the, the place back and, and you find out what they're interested in and then you try to incorporate some interest-based negotiations which I'll talk about later and then what you do is you try to um, you know you find out if there's anything other than the price that you can negotiate on and then you incorporate that into your offer try to make it as uh, you know as attractive as possible put a put a decent deposit down like five percent usually uh, put a copy, photocopy of your bank draft uh, that shows the seller you're quite serious. So that is um, one of the strategies. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's that. I think that's all I need to talk about that. There's more tips and stuff to watch out for in my book on uh, first few chapters. Uh, which mortgage broker lender do I use? Everybody know the three different mortgage brokers out there? Okay, so there's one type, the mortgage broker who works for our DLC, the independent one. This guy is, he has a mortgage broker's license. Okay, he has to take a mortgage broker's license, he gets licensed, and then he works for an independent mortgage broker, mortgage brokering company that works with different lenders. And then there's the guy that uh, works at TD in the back office somewhere, and then they, they can sell you mutual funds, term deposits, and they can also give you a mortgage. This guy gets paid a salary. He gets paid a salary, he doesn't get a commission, and he promotes only his bank's products. So if he works at TD, he promotes TD products. And then, there, and then there's the, the, the last mortgage broker. He works uh, at the bank, but for TD it's called the mortgage uh, specialist, more mobile mortgage specialist. So this guy works for the bank, but he gets paid commission only. He doesn't need the mortgage broker, uh, he doesn't need the mortgage broker's license as well. He works for TD, he gets paid commission by TD, and he can only promote TD's products. Okay, so those are the three mortgage broker types. Uh, how do you choose one? I would say uh, never shop for the rate. Okay, how many of you, like, um, how many of you know that the, the banks get you on the back end? Do you understand? Yeah. <laughs> so they lure you in with a low rate on the front end and then, and then they give you this big giant contract that they don't really go through in detail. And then you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then like, you're like, oh, can I make an extra payment here? Oh, that'll be a hundred bucks. And then <laughs> can, I, can I pay it off a little bit early? Oh, that's another 5,000 bucks. And th that's how they get you. It's like, it's like Apple's strategy. Do you know Apple? Apple, they, they sell you the iPhone and then they're like, they, they get you on the like earphones, the case, the cables, that's where they get all the margins. It's not really through the, they get margins through the, the, the handset, but the, the accessories is where they kill you, right? The iTunes and all that stuff, okay? So uh, same with lenders, they, they get you in the back end. Never shop for rate, always find out like, uh, be, find out about the additional terms. Is it open or closed, fixed or variable? Is it like, uh, what's the amortization, 25 year or 30 year? Uh, you know, what are the prepayment penalties? Uh, what are the additional fees? If I wanna port my mortgage later, what do I do? Uh, these are like basic stuff that you should talk about with your mortgage broker. So you interview a bunch, see who works best with you, who really cares about you, analyzes your needs, not just, yeah, don't shop for rate, that's it. <laughs> okay, so we'll talk, let's see, next. 
Um, okay, simple negotiation techniques that can cost you thousands, that can save you thousands, sorry. Um, so how do you, any, anybody here a master negotiator here? Okay. Yeah, like I thought I was really good at negotiation. I went and in the MBA, I got this negotiator award. I was like, oh, I'm awesome. Going to the real estate industry, I got, I got owned by those like sharks. And I just, like they were so aggressive and then I was just like, oh, I thought I was good, but no. Okay, so uh, here are some common negotiation techniques that you can learn. Basically, when you go into a place, try to, uh, try to look at um, features of the property and add dollar figures to it. So like if you look at the flooring and it's kind of outdated, what's the cost of changing the flooring? The, the, the bathroom's outdated, what's the cost of changing the, 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 the bathroom? Like, oh, there's a scratch. Oh, what's the cost of repainting? Like try to find, like, um, pick, be very picky. Try to pick out stuff. And if you, uh, if you use if you pick out a bunch of stuff and you like pour it on uh, during the, the, the negotiation process, chances are you'll be able to squeeze something from the seller. Because you'll be like, oh, I need, the reno I need money to, for renovation. Give me some room here. Chances are uh, the seller knows that their, their, their property, you've indicated to the seller that their property isn't perfect. It isn't in move-in condition. So that really helps. That's kind of like common sense. Uh, you know, upcoming maintenance, like is their roof like 25 years old, but then the life is of the roof maybe like 26 years old or 27. Like find out roof, furnace, hot water tank, those are typical uh, things that you should kind of get your eye on and then use that to negotiate. So one of the things I learned in uh, negotiations course in, uh, in, in uh, back in business school was uh, a term called BATNA. Anybody know what BATNA is? Ooh, what is it? Best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? Just a backup, okay? So like you, f you find a property that you love and you write an offer on it, but make sure you also have like a backup plan. If, you, if they don't take it, then I can still look at property like second best, the backup. Right? If you don't have a backup, uh, you're kind of at the mercy of the seller. Okay, so like with that mindset, you you might end up, you know, you're just at a disadvantage. Make sure you have a backup of some sort. Uh, that's called the BATNA. That's a term you should uh, just incorporate in any any sort of negotiation. Um, one of the things that I recommend all my clients do, that most of you are probably aware of, do a home inspection. Uh, the home inspection is often used to uh, dis like identify issues with the property, but often th they identify issues that are not known to the seller. And that's where you can kind of use that to your advantage to get to, to negotiate the price. So like if they find some mold, you're like, yes! You know, hopefully it's not really serious, but if it's a little bit, you're like, oh, it's, it's like, health issue, um, my baby's, you know, mold, and, you know, or if there's like, uh, what a home inspector does is they go into your place, they, they have a moisture meter, so they usually go into the washroom and then they, uh, they, they use their moisture meter and touch behind the tiles, and if there's moisture, then, you know, the home inspector would tell, um, tell you, oh, there, there's moisture behind, it could be mold, it could be something else, and then you might have to take away all the tiles, and then to take away all the tiles, you need to take away the tub, and to take away the tub, you need to take out the toilet, and then start, like, it's gonna cost like thousands of dollars. So that is awesome, because then you can use that to negotiate. It might not be a big problem, but you can kind of like exaggerate it, and then make it bigger than it actually is, and then use that to negotiate. Uh, Expanding the pie. Anybody ever heard of that saying? Yeah. Expanding the pie? Okay, so great. You want to you share what, what the expanding the pie is, Razan? Uh, Briefly. Okay, so expanding the pie is a concept of if you feel that there is uh, uh, an upper limit to uh, you know, what you want, oh, actually no. 
Uh, let me backtrack. So expanding to pi is the concept of, let's say uh, you have you know, your, the lowest offer that you'll take and the highest offer that you'll take. So you, know, you always want to think about a range. Uh, but you always also want to uh, think outside of that range. You, know, you, you want to be aware of what you're willing to accept but also think outside of it. So maybe there's an alternative to uh, the current offer that you haven't thought of. Uh, so really thinking outside the box. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. Great, great, great. OK, so great. It's basically like uh, when you negotiate, typically, you're, you're negotiating. Most people negotiate on a one-dimensional manner, price back and forth, price back and forth. And that's. Uh, you know, that's great, but it's kind of like elementary. Uh, when you start going to advanced negotiations, you start incorporating um, what I say. So if you're negotiating just on price, you're, you're looking at it as a pie. I want 50% of the pie, or I want 80% of the pie, you get 20% of the pie. But instead of having just the, the same pie, why don't we just throw away the pie, bake a bigger pie, and put it there? Maybe we throw in a milkshake, and like some large fries. Like now, now all of a sudden we're not just compete, we're not negotiating on that small pie anymore. You're expanding the pie. You're talking about things other than price. Let's talk about dates. Let's talk about deposit. You know, oh, it's tenanted. Oh, you know what? Let me, let me, uh, like I'm sure my price isn't great for you, but let me, let me take over the tenancy. You know, you don't have to kick out the tenant. I'll take over it. I'll do all of that stuff. You don't have to clean up. I'll I'll t take care of it. You know, or maybe yes. Or you, uh, you here you go. Uh, swapping intangibles for tangible. Yes. So I giving you uh, like I took over the tenant, whatever, and give him some leeway so he doesn't have to get rid of the things he doesn't want to do. Yes. So that way, in a way, you're saving him money. Yeah. But uh, in a real sense. You're not giving out any money. Yeah. Because you, you're going to rent it anyway. So. Great. So you're not losing That's anything. awesome. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, Bill. Bill. Thanks, Bill. So basically, not just focus on the price. Okay. So uh, when I was talking to uh, the veteran real estate investor who made me realize I know nothing about real estate investing, he said when he buys properties, he buys everything. He's like, I want all the furniture. I want your car too. I want everything. And then the, the seller's like, uh, oh, okay. And then, so sells them everything. And then he, he takes the furniture and he uses that to trade with the contractors to, to renovate his property. It's like, oh, can you renovate the bathroom? I'll give you this sofa. <laughs> and like, oh, can you renovate this? I'll give you this car that I got too. And he uses that and I was like, so ingenious. And like, I was like, wow, that's so smart. So like, this is what, high-level veteran real estate investors, they do. They just think outside of the box and, and they're doing like, stuff like that. Uh, I haven't written an offer where I you know, said, I want your car too, but you know, taking the furniture, sometimes it's common if uh, the buyer likes the furniture. So uh, the last tip I want to talk to you guys about for negotiation is uh, submitting two offers, okay? Like most, most buyers, most buying agents submit one offer to the, uh, to the seller, to the listing agent. But have you thought about submitting two offers? You know, how about you take this subject, uh, subject offer, subject to financing, subject to home inspection, all the subject clauses. Let's say the property is worth 500,000. It's asking 500,000. You submit a $490,000 offer subject to a bunch of stuff, like everything, subject to my mom's approval. Something like that, you can write, by the way, <laughs> Subject to, you can write subject to anything, anything. You can say subject to my mom's friends, dogs, like uncle or whatever. You can say that, okay? Um, or you can, and then, so you submit the 490 subject to all this bunch of stuff to protect you, to get you out of the deal. And then you submit another offer. Okay, you don't want the subject clauses? I'll give you a 470 offer, subject free. No subject, I'm not gonna do a home inspection, I'm not gonna do anything. No, like, I've got all the financing, whatever. I'm not gonna read the strata documents. Subject free, 470. So, because I have to take on the risk of buying this property, not, not knowing if there's problems to it. So that's why I'm not gonna pay for the risk 
like if you want me to adopt this risk, I'm going to pay you less. So that's why a 470 offer. So then the seller is left with two offers. Okay, do I want more money? 490, but then there's a long subject removal period. Like, you know, it could take two or three weeks, and then the, the buyer might change their mind, which they often do. Uh, or do I take this 470 offer? It's $20,000 lower, but it's like done, right when I sign it, it's done. So uh, one thing that you learn in real estate is time kills all deals. Time kills all deals. Like buyers change their minds very quickly. Sellers change their mind very quickly as well. So sellers know that, hopefully sellers know that, and so they know that, oh, if I have a subject offer, you know, they go see it during the subject removal period, <laughs> they bring on some friends, and the friends go, oh, maybe it, this is a bad idea, or something like that, and then, the and then the buyer's like, oh, having all these doubts, oh, I don't want it anymore. So the seller say, hmm, $20,000. So this is a technique to, you know, get yourself a better deal. Don't just write one subject offer, try to write a subject free offer if you, and if you're like, oh, if you're worried about the home inspection, do a home inspection beforehand. And yeah, you have to pay three to five hundred dollars. But you know, when you buy a used car, you you get a mechanic to inspect it, right? So you pay hundred dollars. You don't get that back. Same for when you buy a house. It's kind of like the cost of playing the game, right? You have to put in your put in put in the money. Uh, the next topic, I'll go through it very briefly. How can I benefit from a home inspector? What does he do? Uh, basically, for houses, he looks at the roof, he looks at the electrical, looks at the furnace, the wa hot water tank, looks at any cracks on the floor, maybe there's something wrong with the foundation. Uh, he looks at whether the appliances work, the outlets. Um, basically, he looks at the stuff that he can see. He's not going to move the fridge and see if there's any holes behind the fridge or anything. He looks at pretty general stuff, right? And then for, um, he checks water moisture and that kind of thing. Uh, for condos, they look at the mechanical room, the electrical room, uh, the furnace, they go up to the roof of the, the apartment building, uh, they check the amenity room, see the condition. They also, some of them, they also uh, read your, the warranty report, the five-year warranty report, the 10-year warranty uh, engineering report. They also, some of them, read your engineering, uh, sorry, read your depreciation report. How many of you know what a depreciation report is? Okay, a prize for who can explain what it is? A book for who can explain what it is? Okay, Joanne. Uh, depreciation report is the report that tells you what the problems uh, are with the building, and they also come up with an idea how much it, it, it would cost to fix the problem in about 20 to 30 years, and they're very proactive, they have a plan, uh, to put up some contingency, contingency fund to fix the problems. Great, good, good summary. Great. Great. Yeah, here you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so it's like, uh, yeah, basically it's mandated by law from the Strata Council in December 2013. Every Strata uh, Council complex needs to uh, hire an engineering company. Uh, costs like $15,000. The engineering company comes to the complex and they look at the structure, they look at your, your finances, and they predict. They predict, so you have 20 years left on your roof, 20 years left on your building envelope, five years left on your windows. Do you, based on your strata fees and your savings account, contingency reserve fund, do you have enough money to pay for that in 10 years time, 15 years time? If you don't, let me suggest special levy, increase the strata fee, something like that. So that's a depreciation report. Uh, some strata councils uh, vote to not do it. So even though it's mandated by law, you can, the strata council can say, no, we're a brand new building, we don't need it. So they, they don't want to spend the 15 grand, they vote, they don't do it. So that's, that's what they do. Some, so what I'm talking about, some home inspectors will actually read your depreciation, re depreciation report. It's like 100 pages and they'll give you their assessment. So uh, one, there's, uh, there's three always that I always talk about. Unless you're an experienced contractor, I would recommend always to get a home inspection. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. I'm a realtor, I bought my place in Richmond, and I hired 
a, a, a home inspector. I read the depreciation report, I read the warranty report, but I still, just for the peace of mind, 300 bucks, 400 bucks, I want that peace of mind, get my like, home inspector to do it. So he read the depreciation report too, and you know, said the same stuff that I, I knew of the property too. So I would, I would recommend always put a subject to a home inspection or always get one done, get a home inspection done. Second always is, yes? Um, so what are we talking about? Oh, are the we always, we're, we're talking about the, the three always for home inspections. Okay, uh, so how many? Yes, Hi. yeah, it, oh. it goes directly to How the many calendar. years are we looking at before we get an inspection done? For, uh, I would say even, even newer properties uh, within, okay, the, the question is how many years before you should do a home inspection, how, how old it should be. For your peace of mind, I would say uh, if it's older than a year and a half, do a home inspection. Why? Because if you know, how many of you know the two, five, 10 year warranty really well? Okay, so two, five, 10 year warranty, it, 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 you think the two year is, oh, two year for the labor and five year for the envelope in case there's leaks, 10 year for the structure. But if you look at it in detail, it's actually like 12 months. The first 12, is like just 12 months, they take care of the, what's, what's going on in the unit. And then, and then uh, so it's not the two years. So you just like read it carefully. And, uh, so that's why like developer will go, oh yeah, we'll take care of it. And then after two, after like 15 months, they're like, oh sorry, like yeah, contact your insurance company or something like that. And then if you, it's kind of like a, a hassle to deal with uh, developers. Sometimes some developers are really good. They'll fix it. They'll come and, and uh, give you good customer support. Some of them, They'll be like, no, it's it's a, it's it's your fault. It's it's the Stratus' fault. You guys didn't maintain the building. That's why it's leaking. And then it's like, so I went through that with uh, one of my clients. He had a penthouse. It's like a less than five year old building, but so it's still under the five year water leakage they, like warranty. But then, so it was leaking. I was I was trying to sell the penthouse. It was leaking. And then the strata was arguing with the developer. This is a well-known developer, I won't say the name, but well-known developer, like been in the business for like 30 something years. And the developer was like, no, it's the strata council's fault. It's because you didn't maintain the property. That's why it's leaking. So it went back and forth, back and forth. They had to hire a roofing company to come and provide a third party inspection and da da da. Anyways, point is, I would recommend if it's, uh, yeah, if it's older than like, 15 months or something, I would do a home inspection. Okay, so does that answer your question? Yes, and is that the same for a house? S yes. House and yes, house. for a house, same, because, um, okay, so for a house, it's the builder who is responsible, like uh, the insurance company, the warranty company, you, you, like, you call the warranty company, the warranty company's like, yes, yes, it's covered under warranty, let me call the builder, so they call the builder, and then the builder will, you know, hopefully they're, they're reputable and responsible and they'll go and try to fix it. If not, they, you know, they will uh, just run away. And <laughs> so, cause nowadays a lot of, uh, not to scare you, but there are builders out there who just like, just, just like, oh, I heard it's easy to make like six figures just building. I'm just gonna get my builder's license and just build a bunch of houses. Yeah, kind of like that. Like and, and because it's under incorporated, you can't sue them. You just sue their company, which has like no money or something like that. So, okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, there are some good builders out there. There are some not so good builders, uh, you know. So yeah, be careful about that. Uh, okay, th the, so three always for home inspections, uh, unless you're an experienced contractor, always uh, do a home inspection. Number two, uh, always be there when you do a home inspection. Why? You're paying the guy to go and inspect the property and you're paying for his time. Make use of it. Like, ask him like a thousand questions. You know, like real estate training, they don't teach you 
the mechanics of a house. They don't teach you, oh, this wiring goes here and da da da. They don't teach you that. So where do I learn it? I learn it from the home inspector. I, like, so when my buyer gets a home inspector, I'm like, oh, so what's this vent? Where does this go? Um, why is this electric connected here? And I just like bombard him with, with questions. And that way I have like elementary basic knowledge when I work with buyers. And then you as well, when you hire a home inspector, um, yeah, it's great when you have the report at the end, but ask the home inspector like a ton of questions. It's, you're paying the same amount of money. You, you might as well be there. The third, uh, the third always, I would say always choose a good home inspector. Uh, don't just go for the cheapest one. <laughs> uh, the saying you pay, you, you get what you pay for is kind of true. Uh, so like I've, I've seen, like I recommend my buyer, oh, you should choose this home inspector. He gives you one year post customer support and he does this and explains this, explains that. And then he goes and hires this, uh, I don't know, this like old Chinese home inspector that he got on Craigslist. And it was like 150 bucks and, and then, uh, <laughs> You know, this, he, uh, he, he's okay, he's like jotting down stuff, taking some pictures and um, you know, the, the apartment, luckily the apartment was in decent standard, decent shape, um, but you know, you can kind of sense the professionalism and, and um, yeah, you get what you pay for. So yes, I would, I would spend the extra 150 bucks, 200 bucks and get someone reputable. You know, someone who has been in the contracting industry uh, for a long time and that kind of thing. Uh, oh, last for home inspectors. Home inspectors, you you know that they can all the, they can do the home inspection, but they cannot provide appraisals. They cannot tell you if it's a good buy or not. Uh, those are things that you should um, keep in mind when you have a home inspector. They can't tell you about that. Okay, let's take a two-minute stretch break. All right. So uh, number five is what to look for when reading strata documents. Uh, the purpose of the reading purpose of the strata documents is basically to know um, what goes on in that strata building. What's the uh, what's the gossip? You know, you want to find out what's the juicy stuff. Are there break-ins? Do they have a marijuana grow up? Uh, you know, are the tenants uh, you know throwing uh, crazy things off their balconies? Uh, and I'm not talking about the general cigarette butts and stuff. They, some of them throw some interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, it, whether there's a lot of Airbnb, uh, you know, make sure, like some condos, they say rentals allowed, but they have a bylaw that restricts B Airbnb. So be careful of that when you're buying condos. If you're planning on using it to doing Airbnb, um, like stratas don't really like that. And if they don't have a bylaw, uh, prohibiting short-term rentals, they might enforce one in the near future. Um, let's see, meeting minutes, yes, you want to you wanna get the meeting minutes in the last two years. Strata plan, a strata plan basically when a developer, yes, Sorry. yes, um, here. Airbnb. Yes. Okay. So if it's not written in the bylaw, mm -hmm. um, then you really can't enforce it. Yes. And the city will not want to get involved because yes. there's too many. Okay. Right? So the city cannot enforce it. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So the question, did everybody hear the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the question was that Airbnb, uh, if it's not written in the bylaws, then the city, the city can't, um, no, the, if it's not in the bylaws, yeah. Yeah, if it's not in the bylaws, the strata cannot enforce it, and then the city doesn't really enforce it as well. But here's, here's the situation. Um, how many of you know that bylaws change often? <laughs> yeah, okay. So what they do is, uh, like in the, when they build the complex in the beginning, oh, everything, they have the standard bylaws. Rentals allowed, pets allowed, everything. And then as time goes by, the strata changes and they're like, oh, let's limit the rentals. Oh, let's limit the, the pets. Oh, let's limit this, let's limit that, let's limit this. And then, um, you know, uh, an example of downtown is the Woodward's building. So in the beginning, Woodward's building, built by West Bank, the very reputable developer, uh, they were allowing rentals and uh, pets and all these things. And then, and then P 
people bought in the place thinking they can use it for uh, Airbnb, short-term rentals. And for a while it was okay. And then Strata said, no, nah, no, nah, we're getting all these interesting people coming in back and forth. And, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, how many of you know that, like, uh, like, there's people who use their units for other stuff other than renting it out for short term. Like, they kind of use, um, they, 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 they make it into like, um, yeah, like, oh, yes, elaborate. bartering services. I put some woman in there, and you go in there, and you pay for some service, and then some service is given, and yes. So like, Stratus don't like that. So Stratus started like, like, like locked down on that. So in refer reference to Airbnb, like Woodward building, downtown, they start incorporating. They're like, oh, we put in, a, they amended the bylaws. So they have it. When you buy into a condo, there will be eight, there are meeting minutes that they are held every month or two months. Then there's the AGM. AGM is an annual general meeting. What they do is everything that they need uh, st uh, things voted on. They, they have an annual general meeting and the owners go there and they vote on it. Should we restrict whatever? And then let's see the votes. And then should we enforce this bylaw or should we change the bylaw to this? And um, you know, so what happened with Woodward's is they started enforcing no short-term rentals. And then obviously some tenants were, uh, some uh, owners were not happy. And then one owner uh, just ignored them and kept doing his thing and then so what the strata said was, oh, this person ignored me, ignored us for, and then every, so we're going to charge them $200 for every bylaw infraction. So he infracted it. He broke the law once for how many months? Well, he broke it for two years. So let's charge him 200 bucks a month for two years. And then slapped a $5,000 like fee on this owner. And then, and then the owner was like, uh, like, no, no, and then the strata's like, oh, here's a lawyer, and da, 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 and so anyways, the strata won. So uh, the strata has quite, quite a bit of power, right? So um, that's, that's what we were talking about. We are talking about Airbnb, right? Okay, the bylaws, right? Uh, strata plan, okay, strata plan, it's the developer gives a plan to the city um, when, before they build a property. And then, so when you buy a property and you want to know, is it actually 800 square feet? You look at the strata plan and the strata plan is usually a meter squared and you convert it. Oh, okay, it is 800 square feet. But that's the legal document. Strata plan is the legal document. But you, let's say you're really like, like skeptical. You hire a measuring company and the measuring company comes in and measures, hey, it's only 775. And then uh, you, you want to take the developer to court or whatever. But um, how many of you know that just because it's on the strata plan doesn't mean it's like 100% accurate? <laughs> okay, okay, good, good. Because sometimes they submitted it and then when they're building it, it's like, oh, well, this pipe is in the way. Let's build around it. So, so it shrinks the, the unit size, okay? So that's what you need to know about the strata plan. There's a form, rental disclosure statement, form B. We talked about financial statements, how they spend their money. Okay. Uh, how to choose the right realtor for you. Um, okay, what do you guys think is important for you when choosing a realtor? This is for a book, the last book. Who wants to, who wants to give me some what's important to you? Here, can you pass it to him? Back. Yes, yeah. It's not amplified, but it's connected to the, the video. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I guess you'd want to click well with the person. You want to work well with them, be able to communicate well, uh, effectively. Uh -huh. um, you'd also probably want to be able to clarify what you want in your deal, yeah. and they can reciprocate. And okay. their expertise, I think that's really important. If their expertise is in buying homes, you don't want to buy a condo from them, probably. So. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. OK, great. Thanks. Here's a book for you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So I think um, these are my five requirements, okay? If I were 
like not a realtor and I was hiring a realtor, these are my five requirements. The person has to be knowledgeable and he takes time to educate me. That's, that's my requirement, number one. Number two, he doesn't have to be a know-it-all, but he has to be willing to find the answer and is constantly learning. Uh, in real estate, everything's changing all the time. You have to always constantly learn, bylaws change, building codes change, uh, like, like, uh, like Home Warranty Act changes, the Tenancy Act changes, all these things. So this, this realtor has to be willing to always constantly learn. Uh, obviously ethical and honesty through full disclosure. I'm going to see if this guy's fully disclosing stuff. Or, or is he just saying, oh, sign here. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'd be, uh, yeah, I'd be a little bit questioner, like I'd be a little bit skeptical if they just tell me to sign here, sign there. Um, and this person thinks of building a long-term relationship with me. They, they actually want to ask what my long-term goals is. They, they want to they go, okay, if you want to buy this, does it match your long-term goals? They, they actually care about not just the short-term, the instant deal. They want to like, really walk with me as like a lifelong uh, realtor. So that's my fourth requirement. Uh, my fifth requirement is they're confident. They know their value and they're patient. Those are my five requirements. Um, yeah, notice I didn't you know, mention like, like the realtor offers me kickbacks or offers me special services or something like that because there are some realtors who offer special services. But I will not go into that. But yeah, anyways. <laughs> okay, uh, age old debate, rent or buy, okay? Uh, who, who, th who here likes, thinks renting is better? Put up their hand. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, and why is it good to rent versus buy? Uh, you got uh, flexibility. Um, yes. Low risk. Yes. So if you don't like the neighborhood, uh, you don't like your neighbor, you can good. move, uh, um, you can always upgrade or downgrade. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great, awesome. Um, okay, so renting, um, so when I was talking to that real estate investor, the veteran guy, he rents. And I was like, why? Why do you rent? And he was like saying the similar stuff, flexibility, and he was talking about you, you can save on the down payment, and he uses that down payment to invest in other properties. And then he says he doesn't have to pay strata fees, he doesn't pay property taxes, he doesn't pay for repairs, he, doesn't, he just causes... Uh, you know, calls his landlord and goes, oh, the sink's broken. Oh, the toilet's broken. Can you fix it? Uh, it's not, not tied down to one location, like you said. And here's uh, a great reason. You can often, he told me, like, he's renting in uh, Yale Town, and it's like a thousand square feet, and he's paying, like, two bedroom, whatever, with view, and he's paying, like, $2,000 a month. And, and then I was like, okay. So what I realized is that Often, landlords charge below market value rent. How many of you know that? How many of you have seen that? And often, landlords, uh, how many of you heard the saying like, oh, well, my tenant's been so nice to me, I'm not going to raise the rent, and they haven't raised the rent for like years. <laughs> how, how many of you heard those kind of stories, right? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so when I talk to real estate investors, they always raise the rent, like yearly, they always. And then uh, I was like, okay, so why do, do the most, why do typical landlords not raise the rent? And then I, I, go, through a, I go through a little of that, a little bit of that in my book, uh, because you know, if you're treating, um, if you're treating your, your rental investment property as a business, then you gotta be in the business, you should charge market value rent, you should offer great service and customer support, but landlords, they, it seems like they wanna just get a tenant and never talk to them ever again. <laughs> it's like, here, sign here, and then bye. You know, I, I'm gonna move to like uh, China or, or Japan or whatever and then never talk to you again. Just keep depositing the check, right? And it's like, huh, like what kind of business survives where like the, owner never talks to the customer. Anyways, anyways, so uh, the, the point is you can often rent at below market value and your landlord uh, might not raise the rent for years. So that's a pro for renting. Cons for renting, obviously, you don't own the property, you need the landlord's permission for renovations, you can get kicked out just like that, meaning 
if they want to sell or other reasons, right? Like uh, in BC, unless the landlord is like selling the property or trying to move in themselves, it's probably almost impossible to kick out tenants. <laughs> like unless you're really, really bad tenant, you can get kicked out, but you can even you can stretch out that that kicking out period, the eviction period. You know, <laughs> for some reason, the Residential Tenancy Act and the they're really favoring tenants, and they. Anyways, I'm like, I won't get into that. Let Let me say. Let, I'll tell you this. So, uh, my client, we had this tenant problem. We had to try to kick him out, and we went by the books. We followed the rules, and they were supposed to be kicked out according to the rules. But then he brought his lawyer in, and oh, I feel sorry for me. And then my tenant has to move out in the winter time. Da 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 da. Oh, extended a couple months. <laughs> so it's like it's very flexible. And then uh, I talked to our, our office. My brokerage had a, a guy from the PC Residential Tenancy Branch come in and talk to us, and he was telling us about tenancy rules, and and basically he said it's all up in the air. <laughs> There's no firm structure. It's like Here's kind of the guidelines, and uh, it can be, you know, bent and, uh, yeah. So it's it's not very uh, set in stone. So to answer your question, uh, flexible. <laughs> okay. So who thinks uh, it's better to buy? Okay, great. Can you explain why? <laughs> so when I buy, I own the property, yeah. and I feel. Um, Secure mm -hmm. is my property, is my investment, and and I pay it off eventually, and I can do whatever I like, and and nobody is going to kick me out, and in the long term, real estate is going to go up, mm -hmm. so and it's great. So awesome, awesome. Thanks, Joy. So yeah, the typical reasons for buying, you get to own something. Uh, nobody will kick you out. Um, you know, uh, when you when you sell it in the future and you made a profit, you don't have to pay capital gains tax. Uh, the cons: you you have to pay all the maintenance, uh, all the strata fees, mowing the lawn, repairs. You're tied to a mortgage. Uh, and how many of you know? How many of you have read Rich Dad Poor Dad? Put up the hand. Good, a lot of you. Okay, so you guys know that buying a home for yourself is not uh, an asset, right? Mm -hmm. It's a liability, yeah. right? How many of you, like, so an asset is something that gives you money, and a liability is something that takes money from your pocket. So when you buy a home to live in for yourself, you're actually, it's a liability, okay? And when you uh, buy a rental property, it's, uh, it's an asset. So that's one of the concepts I, I was, uh, you know, if you haven't read that book, I would highly recommend it. Uh, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, talks about assets and liabilities and that kind of stuff. And the other thing with uh, the cons of buying a home, you have to come up with a large down payment. Yes? But I mean, if you, just say, say five years ago, I mean, if the market's slowly creeping up, I yeah. mean, how could it be a liability if you're owning your own home? I mean, you you, yep. you, you eventually five years later you sell for more yeah. than what you pay for. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I I have to argue with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great. I mean, if it were uh, at the top of the bubble, yep. yes, you can you can uh, it may crash. Yep. So when you when you when you own it, it's a liability. But when you sell it, that's when it's an asset. Right. Yeah. So that's how it works in that sense. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, when's, tr when's truly the best time to buy and sell? Uh, I have a whole chapter devoted to that in my book, but to, I will summarize it very, very quickly. Uh, there's different pros and cons for all seasons. Like spring is the hottest market in the year, greatest competition, greatest selection. Winter, the slowest time of the year, uh, the least amount of selection. Uh, so. You know, and then summer and fall, there's pros and cons close to like people, like it's, it, they say it's um, summer, it's slowing down from spring and uh, fall, it starts picking up because people want to get their kids in the uh, certain school catchments. But the bottom line is uh, I tell my clients, buy when you're ready and sell when you're ready. You know, and don't, don't just buy when everybody tells you to buy. And don't sell when everybody tells you to sell, because the worst you could, the worst thing is 
buying and you're not ready. You're like not mentally ready and you're just following the crowd. Everybody's like, buy, 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 just buy this, buy this, buy this. Like, yeah, you might make some money, but you're like, your financial situation is not stable or your, your life situation is not stable and then people, you follow the crowd. So I always tell my clients, just when you're ready, that's the best time. You know, there's always great deals, okay? It's not like spring is the best time. It's not like winter is the best. There's a pro and a con for every season of the year. And that's in, uh, I go into like a lot of detail in the, in the book. You can go into that. Okay, real estate investing can be this easy. Uh, you know what the most common question I get from my clients uh, about real estate investing? They say, they say, Gary, they go, Gary, um, what should I invest in? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, what, what, what do you mean, what, what, what should I invest in? It's like, if I'm a stockbroker and somebody goes, uh, Gary, which stock should I buy? Like, there's tons of stocks you can buy. It depends what your situation is, what's your budget, what's your goal, what's your condition. So are you, uh, you know, in real estate investing, there's so many different ways to make money. Uh, it, I have to really sit down with my clients and, and really find out what they want. Do they like flipping? Do they like uh, short-term flipping or long-term flipping? Do they like rental cash flow? Uh, all those things I talk to them about. And it's not as simple as, oh, just buy this. <laughs> it's, it's really not that simple. Um, so. Uh, let's see. So what do I usually tell my clients? I, I tell them a little bit about rental cash flow. Like, do you want to be a landlord? Do you want to build a business where you own 10 or 20 or 30 properties in the future? What kind of landlord do you want to be? Do you want to be a lazy landlord where you don't like talk to your tenant ever? Uh, or do you want to be a rich landlord where you like increase the rent every year, you provide excellent customer service and like no judgment against those lazy landlords. You, well, if you're a lazy landlord, then of course you're going to charge less because you didn't provide service, right? But if you're a rich landlord, that means you're upping the rent, you're charging higher rents and you have to bring value to them. You better be uh, offering other services, uh, maybe like free pay-per-view, uh, free cable TV or something, free, uh, we'll cover your utilities and we'll bundle that into the rent. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll incorporate, oh, you're, a, you're a, a business person. I will provide dry cleaning for your suits every three months. You know, I will provide, uh, oh, you know, I'll throw in cable TV into your rent and I will give you two pay-per-view movies every month. Something like that. That's why you're able to charge the high rent. You don't just charge high rent and they go, why are you charging me high rent? So-and-so next door is charging me like $300 lower. You can justify it. Well, I'm providing this and that. I'm changing your, your flooring every five years. I'm upgrading your appliances to stainless steel every five years. I'm doing this and this and this and this. And then the, the seller is like, okay, you're providing a lot more value. Then the, the the tenant is willing to pay more. So we talk about rental cash flow as one strategy, and then we talk about flipping. We talk about short-term flipping. And then they go, oh Gary, like I heard back in the early 2000s, you just buy pre-sales and you flip them. Um, okay, it worked then, but um, for pre-sales flipping, like you have to be really careful. Not all pre-sales are like guaranteed to make money. You know, like um, you just have to be, be careful. Like it's kind of supply and demand. You're buying a pre-sale. If the pre-sale is the same as every other pre-sale out there, there's nothing special about your pre-sale. So why would somebody pay a premium to buy your pre-sale later? You know, but let's say you're buying the Trump Tower. You know, and you buy the Trump Tower like when it's early in and it's like there's no comparable like the Trump. So when you buy it early in, before the developer uh, jacks up the price slowly, right? You know that when the developer first announces the tower and then the people get early access, they buy it at the cheapest price, right? Later, they, the developer starts increasing the price, right? So if you buy it in the, in the onset, in the beginning, 
then like in a building such as the Trump, I would say you're, you're, pretty, you're pretty safe to, uh, to making money. And then within the pre-sale, you don't just buy any unit. Even if it's a good building, you don't just go, oh yeah, I just, it's a great building, I'm just gonna buy this unit and, and I'll make money. No, you, you choose, you be a little bit more selective. Like such as you buy the penthouse or sub penthouse, you, or you buy a unit that has a larger terrace than all the others. And uh, those kind of, uh, if you search, if you, if you look carefully and you buy strategically like that, you're almost, uh, you increase the probability that yes, you, you'll make money, but you're more, it's, it's a, a safety cushion that you're, you're gonna make money for sure. When, you're, when other people are trying to flip their pre-sales in competing with your uh, unit in the same building, your unit is better because it has a bigger terrace, it's, it's the sub penthouse or it's the sub sub penthouse, it has unobstructed views of the mountain or it's facing this direction. So I usually talk to them about short-term flipping that way. And uh, I usually tell my clients, don't buy apartments and townhouses for short-term flipping uh, unless you really know what you're doing. Unless you buy it at like 20% uh, below market value and then you're planning on you know, uh, you know, renovating it a little bit and you gotta... So this is what they talk about in the real estate investing world. You have to buy it at 20% below market value so you have a cushion and then when you hire contractors to renovate and flip, make sure your contractors are charging you uh, like a really low fee and make sure you renovate stuff that actually adds value. Don't just, um, you know, what's an example of a useless renovation? Anybody? Okay, yeah. I've heard the, some houses, the, some, some houses like a solarium, certain things is, it, that doesn't gain any value. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So certain certain areas, like so, the typical things to renovate that add the most value are like kitchens, bathrooms. The things that don't really add value are like, I don't know, uh, you know, like you want to spend, you want high quality glossy paint, right? Uh, that that's like doesn't make sense, right? Or you need like you need like fifteen thousand dollar flooring or something like that. Or like, you know, there's certain things that that really add lots of value and then there's things that don't really add so much. So uh, make sure you talk to uh, you know, your realtor about that. And then um, long-term flipping, it's like you're buying a, a blue cap stock. Like you're buying Berkshire Hathaway, you're buying Microsoft. You're looking at down the road, five years, 10 years down the road, what is it looking? And in that case, <coughs> Like I usually talk to my clients, well, when it's 10 year, when you have a 10 year uh, timeline, it really depends on what kind of, uh, what kind of, like what's your budget first, and then which area do you want to invest in? Well, yeah, you wanna invest in the boonie land where it will uh, appreciate in value because you looked at the community development plan through City Hall and it looks like it's gonna develop. So that's one strategy, but you know, in, in Vancouver, it's, um, it's almost a no-brainer. You can almost buy anywhere, like a house anywhere, and almost guarantee you to make money. It depends how much money you wanna make. The ROI, and anyways, real estate investing, it's not a simple five-minute talk. I, I should uh, like remind you that it's, it's more like a more sit-down, comprehensive uh, analysis of your goals and needs and that kind of stuff. Okay, so just a couple of minutes left. How to do your due diligence when buying, so get pre-qualified. Okay, how many of you know about oil tank inspections when you buy houses? Okay, one person. <laughs> okay, um, how many of you don't know what an oil tank is? Okay, there's one person. Uh, so I assume everyone else knows what an oil tank is. So if you're buying a house in Vancouver, and it's uh, not brand new, if it's built uh, before 1970s, there's a chance that there's an oil tank underneath the property. Because back in the olden days, uh, houses were powered by oil. So they had an oil tank underneath, and the oil powers the house and generates the, uh, the fuel, the energy. 
Uh, and then what happened when they changed the gas, they, a lot of them took out the oil tank. Some of them just cut the, the pipe, or some of them just plugged the hole and, and decommissioned it. And they took out, some of them took out the oil, which is good, but some of them just left them there. <laughs> and if it's left there, um, the, the lifespan of an oil tank is about 25 years. So if you have a 1930s house and there's an oil tank underneath and it was not, and the oil was not taken out, there's a chance that it leaked. It leaks. And uh, what happens if it leaks? If it leaks into your own uh, property, yeah, still some problems. But if it leaks to your neighboring properties, then you're in trouble. Like lawsuits can be anything from like a couple of thousand dollars to uh, the max I heard was $150,000 lawsuit. That kind of thing. So uh, oil tanks, long topic, but to uh, shorten it, if it's an older house and it's in Vancouver, ask the listing agent, do an oil tank inspection. It's only like 250 bucks. They, they do a scan. And even though they do a scan, it's not a 100% guarantee. Okay, Just to let you know about oil tanks. Uh, let's see, know the comps, okay. Do your due diligence when buying, know the comps, don't pitch, don't pinch pennies. Uh, this is probably common sense, but uh, when you negotiate, when you buy a property, don't like, don't piss the seller off. <laughs> so what I mean by that, like don't give them a low ball offer. Uh, it's, it's pretty common sense, but like I, I hear like buyers offering like 50% of what the, the property's worth. Like the property is worth, like I was talking to another realtor and she was saying, yeah, she had the listing as a million dollars and then they got an offer um, from a particular buyer group uh, and the, the offer was like $500,000. And then the, the, this realtor told me, oh, I know that kind of buyer group. Uh, they usually negotiate like that and um, don't worry, they'll come up, but the seller freaked out, right? And in the end, it sold for $950,000, uh, $950, so that was good. But usually, uh, if you want the seller to want to negotiate with you, uh, don't piss the seller off. Don't give them an offer so low that they'll like spit on it and rip it up, okay? So I usually tell my clients, uh, they go, oh, let's write a low offer. Okay, that's good. Write a low offer that's low enough that it's still counterable. Like, it will not piss the seller off. It'll be like, it's low, but okay, I'll counter this. You know, yeah, never piss off the seller because sellers, they're, they're selling their property and no matter how much experience they've had, uh, I talk to experienced sellers and stuff, they, uh, they're, they're emotional <laughs> when, when they're selling their property and if somebody throws them a low ball offer, they just like, oh, screw them. And then they like, you know, they, they just really difficult. So yeah, don't, uh, don't piss the seller off. How to spot bargains in the market? Um, yeah, like another most common question I get from clients. Oh, I just want to buy a great deal, a bargain. Um, so, <laughs> uh, okay, let's start off with this. There are bargains everywhere in, in Vancouver real estate. There are bargains everywhere. Uh, it's not always obvious, uh, but they're out there. Um, one thing I learned in when I first started in the industry was some, some realtor told me, uh, like colleagues said, hey Gary, you know, buying real estate is not like shopping at the bay. Okay, I was like, what, what, what do you mean shopping at the bay? He's like, yeah, you don't just go, you know, on the bay, at the bay, you go to the bay and you buy a, a, a shirt and it's on, it's a bay day, so it's like 20% off. And then there's a scratch and, scratch and save. And then when you scratch, oh, another 15% off. And then you have a Bay card. Oh, remember, another 15% off. And then you have the, your Capital One, like dividends, and like it's like the special Bay Day, and another 30% off. And then the $100 shirt is like 20 bucks at the end. That does not happen in real estate, okay? Like I've never heard of it happen in, in real estate. Uh, so <laughs> I, that was interesting for me to uh, hear that kind of uh, metaphor. So yeah, yeah, it's true, it's true. And uh, so, okay, so how do you spot bargains, okay? How do you spot bargains? Everybody's looking for the lowest priced 
property. They're like, oh, you know, it's, uh, we're looking at this particular building. Everything's uh, selling for 700,000. Oh, this one came up for 680. It must be a bargain. It must be a bargain. And they think that's how you should shop for bargains. Uh, so I was talking to uh, th those like veteran real estate investors, and this is how they shop for bargains. They just do this: offer, 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 everywhere, offer on everything, and uh, like on every property they see, like just tons, like multiple offers everywhere. And now it's like, why do you guys do that? Because they said to me, it's not in. Uh, they they don't mind paying um, more than what it's asking if the terms are okay. So what, what does that mean? So like, oh, your property's worth 500,000. I'll give you 550 for it, but you give me a, a vendor take back mortgage, meaning you give me a mortgage for 25 years and you give me 0% interest <laughs> or something like that, you know, something crazy like that. But it's, 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 and then they calculate, oh, how much would interest cost and that kind of thing. And veteran real estate investors are really creative. And they, they use these kind of tips and strategies that uh, work in their best interest. So uh, a little bit about thinking about outside of the box. But the key, one of the main keys to getting a great bargain, just make a ton of offers. Don't worry if it's overpriced. Don't worry if it's well priced. Don't worry if it's underpriced. Just make a bunch of offers. Uh, I actually tell my clients to make uh, offers on overpriced listings. Why? Can anybody think about why I would tell my clients to make offers on overpriced listings? Smart, 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 smart. Okay, so because under, uh, well-priced and underpriced listings, there's multiple offers, everybody's going for them. Then the overpriced listing, I wonder what the seller's thinking. Oh, it's been on the market for like X number of months, nobody's here. And then you come in with a, like a low offer, and then they're like, well, you know, I haven't gotten anything, no, not even showings, so I guess I'll entertain this one. And then what I see, so I, I watch the market like regularly, daily and stuff like that, and I see like, so I saw this listing, like many listings, super overpriced. But suddenly when, they, when it sells, it sells underpriced. And I was like, huh. So that, that made me think of the strategy. It's like, because people see the overpriced listing, and then most people shy away, but the smart guys, they write an offer anyways, and they just try their luck. You know, they try their luck. Maybe they'll, they'll get lucky and uh, because the seller might be more motivated now because there's, uh, it's been on the market for X number of months and uh, less competition, and, and then maybe their motivation changes. And before they're, before they're willing to lower their price, somebody comes in with, a, with an offer. So don't be afraid of, uh, of overpriced listings. That's, uh, that's what I want to say about that. Uh, oh yeah, how to spot bargains. Uh, you know, don't be afraid of like T-junctions, like big streets, uh, it's like the, the house is beside a church or beside a temple. You know, those are the ones that actually you get a great deal on. <laughs> you know, actually like, uh, like people say, like, so I, I'll tell you a story. Like, um, that I learned, I, I was listening to my coworkers talk about it. They're like, yeah, you know, like the, um, uh, like the Chinese or uh, the Asian group, they really care about feng shui and, and all oh, like that. It's on a T-junction. I, I can't, you know, it's for my fortune. It's really important. Like, I, I can't have it on a T-junction. And then uh, all of a sudden, the seller reduces the price, and they're like, oh, I want it. <laughs> well, what fortune? I, I don't believe in feng shui. I, I want it. I'll buy it. And I was like, <laughs> Okay, so what I realized is, uh, first, like uh, people, sometimes some people use feng shui to use it towards their advantage to get a better price. And then number two, what I learned in feng shui is there's multiple perspectives on feng shui. So Hong Kong feng shui is different from mainland Chinese feng shui, which is different from Taiwanese feng shui. And then it's like, oh, if it's like, uh, I don't know, like the, the you just add in your own superstition and then like, you know, it's, just, it's so subjective, right? It's so, it's so subjective. So I, I, I don't really, yeah, there's, there are some people that really, really believe in feng shui, but then there are those who just use it. And then those who really believe in it also know that there's ways to counter the feng shui. Oh, it's on the junction, I'll just put a lion there. 
You know, I, I just put a wall here and I put a lion here and I put a cat with the with the like hand here and then oh, all of a sudden counters it. So there's like what I know about feng shui is there's ways to counter it. So you know, uh, that's interesting for me to learn. Uh, okay, I'll I'll finish up with this one. How to find guaranteed best ways to sell your home for top dollar. Uh, Probably you've known, you watch the TV shows on, on HGTV, you know, decluttering, staging, uh, depersonalization. So don't have, don't have your family vacation photos all over the place so that, because the buyer's just gonna start looking at them and, and go, oh, that girl's cute. Or like, uh, you know, like, oh, that guy's hot. And, and then like, just totally ignore the, the property, right? Like just try to make your property uh, like, as neutral as possible. Don't let them, don't distract them with stuff. Okay? Uh, that's what de uh, staging is. Uh, that's what depersonalization is. Do professional photography, videography, floor plan. Uh, um, yes? Uh, staging. Yes. Staging. Staging. Yes. What do you think? For a condo. Yes. Yeah. It's very effective. Yes. In my definitely. Staging is definitely really effective. Uh, sometimes it costs money to stage it, but uh, you don't have to hire a staging company. You can stage it yourself. There's tons of ideas online on how to stage your own home, make it open concept. Everybody knows, right? Don't change the furniture a little bit, make it a little bit modern. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. So um, those are, uh, oh, really important that I've seen a common mistake that I see in the industry. Like, uh, I haven't, okay. When I read the description of properties, it's all, almost all of them are like um, feature driven and not benefit driven. So what do I mean by that? They're feature driven meaning, oh, this is a two bedroom apartment, like one bath, it has one living room, one den, one barbecue or one fireplace and it's just features, facts. They don't tell me about how it benefits me. They don't add they don't make it poetic. They don't talk about visualization. They don't paint a picture for me. They don't paint an experience for me. It's just like facts. It's just reading like a spec sheet. And it's like, I see tons of listings out there that are all feature driven. And not like, there's some that are really good that like paint a picture. Oh, this is like once in a lifetime opportunity. It's, it's lo located on the Golden Mile. And uh, you know it's great for entertaining and da, da, da. like so. Not only do you need to sell on the listing description, when you meet client like as a realtor, when I meet clients, I don't just be like, oh, that's a bedroom, oh, that's a bathroom, you know, like oh, there's a fireplace, oh, that's the balcony. Like I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Like in the beginning, uh, that's what I did because. You know what they te teach us in, in real estate in the beginning? Oh, yeah, the apartment will sell itself. You just open the door. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? And then I did it, and it's not, it's not working. <laughs> and then I, I realized, no, you got to really sell it. You got to, oh, look how the balcony is, and you can entertain, and a bunch of people. And like, if you're ever selling your home by yourself, and you have buyers come in, make sure you paint the picture. Don't just be like, oh, there's a den, there's a bedroom, and... Like you gotta be like, oh, imagine yourself watching your your big screen TV here, and then like your fireplace and a cozy winter night, and da da da. Just paint the experience, paint the picture for the buyers. So that's really important uh, in helping you sell your home for top dollar. Okay, how to find? Okay, really quickly, how to find out what your home is really worth? It's about the impar comparables. Uh, ask your realtor, he can help you with that. Rich landlord versus poor landlord investing. Uh, I will save this topic for my YouTube videos. You can go check it out, Gary Wong Realty on uh, YouTube. I, I have like five videos talking about rich landlord versus poor landlord. Also on my website, I wrote five blog posts about it, so you can check it out. Um, and that's it for uh, today. And that's, uh, I guess we maybe we'll have like 10 minutes Q&A. 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, 10, 15 minutes Q&A. All right, questions? Questions, questions? Yes, Rosalind, here. Hi, I'm more interested in real estate as a, a business and in real estate investing. Mm -hmm. So 
quickly, um, if you can uh, summarize uh, how to use uh, OPM, other people's money, to, mm -hmm. to uh, start investing in real estate. Sure. Uh, lots of different ways to use OPM, other people's money. So let's say you find a deal. Uh, the most common way is uh, you find a deal and then money will come. So you find the deal and then you're like, you, 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 well, you have to pitch the deal to the real estate investors. Like this is a great deal because the re return is this, the return is that, it, it's rentable like this, rentable like that. You put in the money, I put in all the work. The one that I'm connecting yeah. all the... Yes, people. you are the mediator basically. Get the contractor yes. in or whatever. Yes, you do everything and they just put in the money. So how are they going to trust you? It depends on how good your pitch is. So are you, you pitching them, oh it's a great deal. Why? I don't know, it's great. Don't, don't, <laughs> like those guys are sophisticated, they all about numbers, you better have this pro forma for them and explain how the return and the, be conservative, you provide a sensitivity analysis, m meaning best case, worst case, medium case scenario, that kind of thing. And then, like, if you, especially if you have no track record. If you have no track record, you provide an extensive analysis and then if they believe you, they work with you and then great, right? Once you have a track record, then people, you don't necessarily have to like, you know, you still need to be comprehensive, but it's not going to be as difficult. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. That's just one, one, one form. It's like joint venture and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, or is it in, uh, yeah, it is. It is. Inside? Yeah. It's in the last seven chapters, investing. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Alice. Question. Here, the mic. <laughs> so my question is, um, f I hear that there's a government grant or a rebate or something for first-time buyers. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about that? Sure. And how much sure. is it? Um, there's a bunch of grants that they initiate, that they implement. The government has. So there's like, a, like first of all. Everybody know about property transfer tax, first time home buyer, it's exempt. Does everybody know about that? So it's exempt for uh, properties under 475,000. You have to be a, uh, like a, you have to be a principal resident, uh, you have to be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, that kind of thing. Uh, there are other grants like homeowner grant if you're over 65, there's like homo like you, w you pay less on your property tax, that's another grant. Uh, and then there's the RRSP, you talk to your bank and you can use like a portion of your RSP for the down payment and then you don't get taxed on that. So that's another uh, benefit. There's a whole bunch of them and they like kind of change from time to time. So uh, yeah, like if you're interested, just send me an email. I will, you know, give you more information about that. Other questions? Oh, let me grab the mic first. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, what's your honest opinion about near future uh, forecast for market here? Okay. Uh, okay. I love this question because, like, the. What was the question? Oh, okay. The question is, what is my forecast of the market in the near future? I love the question because the people talk to me about the bubble. People talk to me about. Oh no, the China stock exchange it crashed, or oh, we're not going to get Chinese investments, and oh, the market's going to tank and stuff. So earlier this year, how many of you know that they, the government canceled the China investment, uh, immigrant investment program in February? In February, how many of you know that? Okay, great. So they canceled it. Uh, back then, you could come into Canada and you go, here, government, I'll give you 800000 or a million dollars, and then you hold it there. Five years later, I get PR. You give me PR. That's how it worked back then. Now they canceled it, so, and there were like 40,000 on the waiting list, and they all got canceled. So then everybody was scared. Uh, like, not everybody. A lot of people were scared, and then like, people in the real estate industry knew that, no, it's not, nothing to be worried about. Even Bob Rennie went up and spoke about it. He's like, no, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a big problem. And yeah, sure enough, it wasn't a big problem. Uh, the, the market, yeah, it, 
it's like slowed down for the super high-end $7 million, $8 million houses, but not really. It didn't, it didn't really slow down. Back then, it was like the, the currency was still good. I think it was still par at that time. I think the dollar was still par, I think. So um, here's what I learned about China's economy and Vancouver economy. When China is doing well, everybody takes their money and invests abroad. <coughs> buys companies, buys land, goes to buy uh, companies in Australia, buys property in USA, and, all, and things like that. And then when China's economy is not doing well, guess what happens? They do the same thing. <laughs> they take their money and then they invest in China, they're not in China, Canada, USA, Austria. Why? Because it's like China's economy is not doing well, it's unstable. <laughs> so they take their money out because it's unstable. So then they take their money out and they invest it in other places. And then I was like, hmm, so when China's economy is doing well, then Vancouver's economy is like the Vancouver real estate market is going to go up. When China's economy is doing bad, Vancouver real estate market is still going to go up. Hmm. And then like, and then plus the why first. And then I was like, oh, the currency still, it's like 30% cheaper. Or like compare when it was par, people still came from China because it was still cheap compared to what they pay in Shanghai and Beijing. It was still cheap. Now, <laughs> when the ca Canadian dollar is like 30% worse than what it was, it's like a shopping spree. It's like Boxing Day for, for Chinese investors. And I was like, why wonder is such a hot market. And then not only are we competing against mainland Chinese, we're competing against locals because those people who lived, on, lived in $300,000 homes in East Vancouver, now all of a sudden are sitting on $1 million homes. <laughs> and then, so they take their, they're, they're like, like a janitor and they make like $20,000 a year, but all of a sudden they're like a millionaire. And then they take their money out and then they help their children to compete. To, and then, so all of a sudden, you're competing against locals now. You're like, oh, how do these locals have money? Well, they didn't until their parents' properties suddenly skyrocketed. So, uh, so not only are you competing against uh, like mainland Chinese, you're competing against locals. You're also competing against the builders uh, who you know, always want a piece of the pie. And then you're competing against the local mainland Chinese, local Hong Kong Chinese who are already rich. <laughs> you know, they came long time ago and they're already rich. So I'm like, ah, and then I'm not even counting the Middle Eastern, like the, the Dubai princes who come in and just buy like expensive properties, you know? So I don't really see the market tanking. And then the N plus interest rates are super low. US is not planning to raise their rates for, you know, maybe a year or two, and I really don't see any signs of uh, slowing down this year, at least, for sure. Well, I'm not actually here for investment purpose. Yes. I actually want to buy a house. Yes. So what would be a good strategy to you know, buy a house competing against all these people? Um, so, like I talked about, yeah. try the overpriced properties. Like there's two ways. You either bid against the underpriced properties and just go like do the bidding war strategies. You can do that. Or try to buy the ones that people stay away from. T junction, big streets, beside churches, or something like that. Or yeah, actually the best house, you, you want to buy the hoarder house. <laughs> you want a house that's so ugly that that it's like it's so junky that typical buyers stay away from. And then as long as you can see past the junk, then you're, you're, chances are you can you know, get a good deal, right? Like, yeah, it's going to take some work, but if you want a good deal, you know, that's, that's one method. Thank you. Yeah, great. Any other questions? So, yes? So, how do you, okay, so you talked about um, the qualities of a good realtor. Yeah. So how do you go about finding one? I mean, I, I know it's a stupid question. Uh, you interview, interview a couple of realtors. You also have, uh, get some referrals. 
because so-and-so work with that realtor, so if they're referring them to you, chances are they had a good experience with that realtor, so you know, then you can sort of trust that since my friend had a good experience, chances are I'll have a good experience, right? So I would say interview, referrals, uh, look at their branding, talk to them, find out, you know, like just because they're a top realtor doesn't mean they're the right one for you. Just because they're number one in whatever area doesn't mean they're the right person for you. Some, some clients need uh, a lot of hand-holding, right? And they need a realtor who does the hand-holding. But some realtors um, are, are not like that. They, they don't do the hand-holding. They're like, no, I'll do it like this. I'll get it done for you like this, right? Like, um, so I would definitely interview realtors because every realtor does their business differently. Some go, some say you have to sign a contract with me if I want to help you find, help you buy a house, you know? Some realtors don't. So I would definitely recommend you to uh, just interview a bunch of them. There's a lot of times you see them, they just drop a card and they don't want to do Okay, so, so she said sometimes they just drop uh, a card in your mailbox. I would say uh, if, if you're interested, um, try to make a list of ones that you're kind of, you had a good impression with them, and then interview them. Call them up, interview them on the phones so you get a sense of who they are. Uh, I would usually, like, uh, like the website kind of, um, I wouldn't, it's, it's hard to judge them by the website because like, yeah, just because they have a bad website doesn't mean they're, they're like a bad realtor, right? So I would definitely try to talk to them on the phone, see if they're the, the right type for you. Are they really aggressive? Are they really mellow? Are they really, so I would definitely uh, call them and ask them. Yeah, that'd be the best bet. Great, yes? Here, can you pass? And what do you think is the minimum number of years um, to find a, a decent real realtor? Okay. So uh, I would say I would say there's no minimum number of years because my requirements were uh, I didn't have a minimum number of years. I would say some veteran realtors, just because they've been in the business for ten years, doesn't mean they have ten years of knowledge. <laughs> like, like they, they might have been working part-time for the first eight years of their business, you know, and, and they might not have been doing con, uh, consistent learning. So that I have been, you know, in, in my business, I've been like being a sponge in the first three years of my business, and, and I talk to people, and there are some realtors who, like, they're veterans. They're like 30 years in the business, and they're like top, top, top realtors, like making like seven figures, but they, they got in trouble with the real estate board <laughs> because they forgot to do something in uh, like, uh, like Homeowner Protection Act. There's some document that you need and they, they didn't know about it. And I was like, oh, okay. So one thing it taught me was just because they're good at selling doesn't mean they like, you know, they know everything, right? So I would try to, that's why I said that the person doesn't have to be a know-it-all, but the person has to be willing to to find out the answer, find out the answer. Obviously, I don't want a completely brand new, like he doesn't know anything. I don't, I don't want that kind of realtor. But he's got to know something, and then if he goes, I ask him a question, he's like, oh, sorry, uh, I don't know. But like, is, is he just like, I don't know? Or I don't know, but I'll get it for you. I'll go research it, I'll go find it, I'll call City Hall, I'll like dig it up, you know, I'll do go the, the extra mile to find it for you. I rather prefer that realtor than the realtor who's, you know, got 100 deals going on, 100 listings, oh sorry, talk to my team members, right? I prefer, you know, that kind of realtor. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. So I guess, uh, yeah, let's wrap up. Uh, oh, one more question, last question. Okay, one more question after that. Um, my question is that, um, like I'm, as someone with a single income, it's hard to get into the market and I'm not interested in buying like a tiny studio. So I was talking to some friends about possibly doing some joint investment, yes. um, but I know that can be really tricky. So what is your opinion of that? Like your honest opinion? Okay. 
I think it's, uh, it's, it's great if you have the proper uh, written documents in place. Have it all in writing. What happens if you want out? What do we do? What happens if there's a disagreement? Then what do we do? Always have, for joint venture, the key thing is always to have it in writing. You know, what happens if something hits the fan, right? You know, you want to cover yourself and you, you know, you don't want to just like disagree later. Like a contract is there for when there's a problem. <laughs> the contract is, is there just to, uh, like everything is fine when everybody agrees. But when there's a disagreement, hey, what does the contract say? That's, that's why it's important. Uh, I think joint ventures is good. Uh, if you, first, you gotta, you're, you gotta work with some, um, some good partners, trustworthy, uh, they, gotta, they know their stuff. Uh, definitely, you know, have something like, have like something written up, like maybe a lawyer written up, drafted up. You can buy properties together, that kind of thing. Uh, that's a good way of joint venture. A lot of the Indians, um, they buy houses together and they live, them, live in them together. They save their expenses, uh, they minimize their expenses, they don't have to pay rent, and then like, so I see like this house, and like three families live there. <laughs> like they're it's, huge. yeah, they're huge, and then they save all their money. Like they don't, they pay one utility bill, they pay, you know, all that stuff. So it works. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Benson. Cool, so I just want to say that um, I was really impressed by your presentation. And I can tell that you're a realtor that really cares about your clients. Um, so if me or my friends or family have a need for a realtor like yourself, what's the best way for me to reach you? Uh, my contact information, <laughs> Benson's my friend, by the way, so uh, thank you, Benson, for the good words. Uh, <laughs> My contact information is at the back of the book. Uh, I can be reached at GaryWongRealty.com. It's also on the, uh, the, the, the sheet agenda. It's also on that notepad if you, you have it. So uh, yeah, thanks for your time, guys.